I just wanted to give a quick update. It's day 54 of this ginger germination experiment. And as you can see, the plants are getting quite tall. In a strange way, it sort of resembles corn. But, you know, this sand, it's doing its job. You know, my potato series, um, it's actually going to be three series if they all germinate. Um, has this problem with fungus gnats. Uh, this has largely gotten rid of the problem. The sand is a thick enough layer, but I think there's there's still a problem in that the sand is really wet coming out of the bag. That's uh, one thing that kind of annoyed me. And, you know, basically they probably do that just to make more money by giving you waterlogged sand. And when it dries out, it leaves all these cracks along the edges of the pot. And it just has these uneven surfaces. I don't want even a remote possibility of fungus gnats being able to you know get out of the ground layer or get in and lay eggs so I'm gonna have to patch this up at some point it's a lot of work to do so but you know um, the first time around it's always just wet sand going in so when it dries it just kinda still sticks together and leaves all these uh, cracks that bugs can potentially enter and exit through so here you can see a fifth shoot coming out and you know it's grown it's uh, about three centimeters or taller and I don't know where it came from I thought this rhizome cutting only had one bud but apparently not or maybe it just spontaneously generated a new shoot apical meristem because um, there's energy to spare in that rhizome cutting Okay, it's day 57 of this ginger germination experiment. And this plant has grown very tall, the center one. So a new shoot system has emerged out of the sand. And this is from one of those rhizome cuttings from more towards the top, you know, of the original six, you know, rhizome slices. It had two green buds and, you know, they just took forever to emerge. I think this was actually the smaller of the two. There's an amazing divergence between the growth rates of all the different buds from the same rhizome cutting, which should all be genetically identical. This is the shoot system that came out of the broad rhizome cutting from the bottom of the original um, entire rhizome piece that I cut into six pieces. I don't know where this one came from. I thought there was only one bud to that slice, but apparently not. And it's developing into a, a separate plant in very close proximity. So, you know, this one has the most symmetrical development, but it's now being dwarfed by the one that came from the center slice, which is this one, which is just really, really tall. So everything looks to be doing really well, and, you know, I really don't have to do anything at this point. You know, the soil is very moist, and essentially these things will do really, really well without even me adding more water to the plant spot tray at the bottom. So they just continue to grow and you know I don't think these are going to get over like two meters but probably a meter and a half or more is uh, easily possible so in a short amount of time I'm going to have uh, very big house plants. So what's the big deal with uh, monocots and dicots anyway? Well angiosperms are plants that produce flowers and all angiosperms basically are classified into either monocots or dicots meaning they have these uh, either one or two starter leaves and you know grass is a monocot and in the example of grass you know basically the monocotyledon is deep underground and you can't even see it so what you see in the beginning are just true leaves and in a previous episode, I thought maybe this was the monocot, but it's not. It's probably just a weirdly developed first true leaf. And likewise, this is another example of a true leaf. They're just very small at the base. So yeah, this is a true leaf, and that's a true leaf. These are all true leaves, but they seem to get a lot bigger by the time you get to, like, say, the third, the fourth leaf. And that's the same case here. That one's small bigger yet bigger yet even bigger so you know really the third true leaf and on start to get really long and large so monocots are essentially said to have long linear leaves as a typical example um, you know like agaves grasses a bamboo things like that 
and ginger is no exception you know it has these long linear leaves they're uh, just sort of bladed and non fancy you know these seem to have just one vein and they're said to have radial symmetry too so if you look down the spoke uh, they're basically symmetrical to a degree whereas uh, you know dicots um, if you look at my uh, sweet potato germination experiment or my honeydew germination experiment grow very very differently so in the case of ginger I don't think I would be able to see cotyledons unless I dug up the entire uh, rhizome cuttings and examined the very base and I'm not even sure if they're all that visible if they're even large enough so apparently the role of the cotyledons is not very prominent in species like this it's completely opposite of that of you know seed plants that have just tiny seeds with small energy reserves such as uh, the honeydew where it needs large pairs of uh, cotyledons to get started and photosynthesize otherwise it's not going to make it to develop true leaves later on okay it's day 58 of my ginger germination experiment so if you look here I have my LED lamp with the expensive LED bulb and basically provides nice white light for the camera um, akin to sunlight so basically these plants are so tall that I don't need to put it on a, a little ottoman anymore to film it and I've been wondering about something you know the tips of these leaves uh, some of them are a little bit yellow or brown or dying so I was wondering what that's all about it's an instance of a leaf tip necrosis if you will so is that and that's just a dead leaf tip curled up and there's another one so it's ubiquitous at this point you know it's not just limited to uh, one plant or one side of the pot and even this bottom leaf that never you know unfolded off the main stem so to speak for this uh, large central plant off the central rhizome cutting you know that is dying a little bit too so I think it's basically a question of humidity now there's not much I can do about the general atmosphere um, if you look here you know it's nighttime it's really hot indoors you know and the humidity is relatively low compared to most other places where it rains a lot but San Diego is always kind of like that you know like 40 50 percent humidity so even if you look here you know I think those edges look a little bit yellow off this new shoot so I think these are just not getting enough water and I'm gonna just go ahead and water everything because you know, out of the three plants I have on display here, potato tubers, you actually don't want to water too much so the tubers won't rot. And the honeydew, you know, we have a lot of experience. If you haven't checked out my honeydew series uh, early on of over overwatering, especially in a small soil volume. Now, this is a very large soil volume. So every time, you know, I would lay sand on these pots in the last few days, basically on top of the potting mix, you know the soil underneath would seem really damp but ginger is a uh, but ginger is a tropical plant that hails from South Asia and I think Southeast Asia maybe so this plant needs uh, a lot of moisture and I haven't watered in I don't know like uh, it's been close to maybe a month or more and I don't think this is sun damage either because you know it really has been cloudy for the past few days uh, maybe the past three days so if this were to happen you know I think burn spots uh, sun spots would have appeared you know just in random places on the leaves I'm not an expert by any means in you know what causes what are the symptoms of sun damage uh, you know cold damage uh, you know drought damage etc but uh, this is just my educated guess so I'm going to go ahead and water this. So I still don't have a specialized watering device, but I took this, you know, top portion uh, plastic 
container wrapper of a toothbrush and basically cut off one end and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pour water into this trowel and uh, funnel it in there Alright, so I still made a little bit of a mess, you know, I still got some drops on the carpet, but that's pretty full and it's a lot easier than just, uh, you know, kind of pouring a centimeter over the carpet, you know, with a gap between the mouth of the bottle and that lip to this plant spa. So it's pretty much full now. Water should be actively absorbing into the soil from the bottom four slits and there are all those ventilation slits where condensation um, during the day tomorrow will basically you know the the moist water vapor will hit the soil through those uh, slit vents and basically moisturize the soil and further hydrate it that way so we'll see where the water levels at tomorrow it's day 59 of this ginger germination experiment so I thought this ginger germination experiment was going pretty well but I can see kind of a snafu coming up. Um, this just relates to yesterday's problem which is you know new leaf tips are sort of dying and if you look here um, that's uh, quite yellow slash white you know and these are new leaves coming out at the top so if that stuff is dying that means I think this plant just isn't getting enough water. So there's barely any water in there in this plant spa tray for the ginger plant um, after just 24 hours. So that's kind of surprising. It's always surprising how fast this water goes. It went very fast in the beginning of the experiment. So I'm going to water again. Okay, so it's fairly well watered now, and since I watered fully yesterday, I expect most of the soil to be saturated by tomorrow, and hopefully this drought problem should be over. So if there's one thing I've learned about growing plants, it's that adversity strikes hard and often, and since plants can't talk to you or make any kind of you know, movement or sounds to indicate that they're in distress, uh, you pretty much have to figure out what's wrong with them and sometimes that can be really tough so it's really different from raising animals where you know they'll uh, kind of let you know that they need food or water or whatnot so yeah it's uh, not easy